Byron, I think it's because they heard the sound of your voice that they've now decided to come out of their little termite mound. We approached the mound. We got a little bit closer, so they did all run away as they do. They needed to assess the situation to make sure that we were not a threat. And we've been sitting here for about a whole of maybe three or four minutes before they felt brave enough to come out. So maybe they, like I said, I think they heard you, Byron. And I think you can quite easily, you and Jamie can fight over the title for Mongoose Habituator. I'll keep the Zebra and Wildebeest Habituation title. You can have this one. But they are so precious. And now it's quite funny to watch them every time they duck into their burrows again is because every time I move, even just the slightest movement, they can see me. And they're a little bit wary, but hopefully they'll be fine. There's also some crowned lapwings that are alarming in the distance. That's why they're looking over to the right every now and then. And they will listen to bird calls or birds that are alarming because when you're as small as a little mongoose, hang on, Senzo, can you see this little one on the left that's sticking? It looks so fluffy. Don't you think it looks so fluffy? <laughs> Look at it. It's so cute. That is so funny. It looks like it's popped its tail into an electric socket and got a bit of a shock. Now, uh, Lara, I think it's Lara Moore. I'm wondering, oh no, I don't, I can't, hey, oh, that is correct, oh, wonderful, as we look at our very fluffy mongoose over here. Um, sorry, Alice, can I actually have the question again? All the birds are now alarming and distracting me. Let me look over my shoulder to see if it is a Hosanna that's coming out the tree. Ah, no, sorry, ah, oh, Lara Moore, you're wondering if these mongoose would be threatened by the leopard's presence? Uh, most certainly, they will duck and dive, they won't hang around, even with a wild dog, any predators because even though they are small and it wouldn't necessarily be a, a big meal for something like a leopard, you never know. Hosanna will sneak past and maybe snatch one of them up. So the birds, they typically will respond to, because I think at the moment their biggest fear uh, is raptors sort of swooping down and snatching one up. You don't like the camera very much, do you, little one? Yes, I'm talking to you. And... So anybody that alarms, you'll find the mongoose looking about and probably ducking and diving. When you are this small, you've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, the bigger you get, I suppose, uh, there's normally more of you. If you look at the impala and the antelope as they start to get large, and even with the mongoose, they live in good groups. So it's quite difficult, I think, to catch a mongoose because there's so many eyes and ears around to keep a, a lookout for you. And the same thing goes, of course, for the, well, the impala and some of the birds that are a bit gregarious. They're always looking out for each other. But these guys are, guys are fantastic, and I'm hoping that the rest of the, the family are going to come out and join the lot in their sunbathing session. But James has also found some beautiful little mongoose. We have, we found a gorgeous, gorgeous little troop sitting in the sun and they all disappeared when we arrived and then as they realized we weren't about to try and eat them, they've all come out into this little patch of sun and the entire troop is now grooming, doing a little bit of feeding, some playing, some general bonding and having a good time. Now, Cedar Point, you ask a very good question about mongoose and whether they are related to <laughs> meerkats. They are absolutely related to meerkats. They are part of the same family. That's the Hesperidae. Oh, sorry, not the Hesperidae, the Herpestidae. That's their family. And a meerkat is a mongoose. So, yes, very closely related indeed. But, of course, a surrogate or meerkat spends its time largely in the desert regions. And they don't spend the time in areas like this. They're very sweet. <laughs> Uh, 
Ah, so lovely. And what we can hear above them is some calling from a grey go-away bird. And it almost sounds like an alarm. But although I'm interpreting it in that way, it's very clearly not being interpreted that way by these mongoose, who are not looking in the slightest bit alarmed by life. Yeah, they're just cleaning each other. Now, although this cleaning looks very egalitarian and sort of friendly and pleasant, it is part of establishing what is a very strict dominance hierarchy, as it is in a wild dog pack. And so the grooming will have an element of aggression in it in some cases. In some cases it will be toadying up to more dominant members. In others it will be establishing dominance over others. And there are tremendously complicated social arrangements being made and broken all the time within a troop like this. Mongoose are tremendously complicated from a social point of view. And I, I think of them yawning, that's just too hilarious. They keep the most civilized hours, I always say. They spend their mornings in the shade and then they come into the sun late. They don't get up early at all. James, you're wondering about the size of a mongoose troop and if it can get big enough or if it ever gets if there's a maximum size that it can get to before it becomes sort of detrimental to the troops well-being James I, I imagine there is a maximum size I don't know what that size is I'll tell you exactly how big they've you know what the research says but I think what you'll find is that their size or the size of the troop very much depends on the area that they're in and by area, I largely mean, of course, the prey availability. So in areas where there is a greater prey density, you're going to find that they are far more, uh, or far larger. The troops, I mean. How on earth can I not find dwarf mongoose here? There we go. Let's just see what here. just the measurements. I mean, I've seen up to sort of 25 in a troop here, maybe up to 30 sometimes. Daniel in Scotland, you've made a small mistake there. You said, are these the smallest animals that we ever see on safari? Uh, no, they are not. They are the smallest carnivore that we ever see on safari. But we see smaller creatures like uh, well, bushveld gerbils, for example, sometimes we see them. They are very small indeed, about half the size. But of course, when we talk about animals, we tend to we tend to sort of forget, of course, that the little spider that Byron was looking at earlier is also an animal. And so, the smallest animal that we see on drive are probably sometimes the sort of millimeter length spiders. Uh, the tiny little mites we might find on the back of a millipede, that sort of thing, they'd be much smaller. In terms of mammals, the smallest mammal we see is probably something like a bushveld gerbil. Mm -hmm. Seb, you see the white patch on the tree here? Mm, yes. Just pop the camera on there. Look, isn't that cool? <laughs> Now, I think that's what Taylor had yesterday.